All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And in this lesson, this is going to be the fourth and final lesson in our series here as we talk about heart failure. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the different ways in which we diagnose as well as treat a patient who has heart failure. As always, my name is Eddie Watson, and I'm going to be your presenter for this lesson. But before we begin, if this is your first time to this channel and watching our videos here and you'd really be interested in more of this critical care educational content, then please subscribe to our channel below. Make sure you guys hit that bell notification icon, that way you'll be notified as soon as our new lessons become available to you. And with that said, I really do value your subscriptions, the likes, and the comments that you guys leave for us. Uh, they really do go a long way to help support this channel and the videos such as this one, and so for that I do want to thank you guys. All right, so like I said, this is going to be the last lesson in this series that we're talking about heart failure here. In this final lesson, we're going to bring everything together and conclude this series by talking about the different ways in which we diagnose as well as classify a patient with heart failure. And finally, we're going to look at the different ways in which we treat these patients who have heart failure. And this treatment covers a whole wide gamut of different options that are available to us. And so with that said, let's go ahead and dive on in for this final lesson. So the first thing that we're going to talk about for this lesson is going to be how we diagnose our patients. And when we look at these different ways of diagnosing our patients, there's really many different tests that we can use in combination to help us in this diagnosis. And so the first of these tests that we're going to talk about is the 12 lead EKG. Now with the 12 lead, it's not going to be able to truly diagnose that your patient has heart failure, but there are going to be things that you can pick up and see on this that may be indications going along with other tests that you perform that your patient does in fact have heart failure. The first thing that you'd be looking for would be ST or T wave changes. And these could be things signaling some sort of low voltage left ventricular hypertrophy going on. With this, you'd also be looking for those arrhythmias. Could also be looking for any Q waves from any previous MIs they might have had. And finally, you could also use this to check for bundle branch blocks that your patient may be in. So now the next diagnostic test that we're going to talk about is a chest x-ray. And there's really two big things that we're looking for on the chest x-ray when we're talking about our patients with heart failure. The first of these is going to be our cardiomegaly. And this is essentially the enlarged heart that you'll be able to see on x-ray. And this is important because both systolic and diastolic heart failure can lead to cardiomegaly. In addition to that, we're also going to be looking for pulmonary edema. And a chest x-ray is going to be one of the best ways in which we can see this and see the extent of this edema. So it can really show us the severity of heart failure that your patient might be in. But it can also confirm that we have left-sided heart failure going on by seeing that pulmonary edema in place. Now the next diagnostic test that we're going to talk about here is the echocardiogram. And really the echo is going to be the most common and really the gold standard when it comes to evaluating and diagnosing a patient with heart failure. And essentially, an echo is using sound waves to take a visual look at what's going on in the heart in real time. And we can use that to evaluate things like dilation, hypertrophy, valvular disorders, if there's some sort of hypocontractility. And most important, we can look and see what our patient's ejection fraction is. So in addition to being able to diagnose that your patient has heart failure, you can actually use the echo in order to look and see what some of the causes might be that's leading to our patient being in this state. Now the next set of diagnostic testing that we can look to do is to actually look at our patient's hemodynamics. Now ideally our optimal way of getting most of these numbers that we want to look at are going to be if our patient has a Swan-Gans catheter. But there are other ways with other catheters to get some of these numbers or to have an idea of, of what your patient's hemodynamics are. But some of the big things that we're looking for here would be either an elevated CVP, an elevated pulmonary artery pressure, or our patient's cardiac output or cardiac index. So again, we had talked about the significance of these in the previous lesson. Um, but this is another way to get a picture of what's going on with your patient and to evaluate what might be happening in terms of their heart failure. And finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about here are 
labs that we can draw. And for the sake of this lesson, there's really only one that I want to focus on here. There are others that you can look at and can be used to determine what's going on with your patient a little bit more. But the big one that I wanted to mention here is our BNP. And I'm not even going to bother attempting to actually say the full name of what BNP stands for. But the important thing to know is that this is something that's released by the heart as a result of a stretch of the ventricles or a change in the pressure inside the ventricles. And so if we have that stretch or issues with pressure going on inside the heart, like we would see in a patient with heart failure, you're going to see an elevation of this BNP. And so, like I said, this is a quick overview of these different diagnostic tests that are available to us. Again, there are other options that are out there, but this gives you a good quick overview of the most common ones and what you would be looking for with them. All right, so the next thing that I want to talk about here is how we actually classify the severity of heart failure that our patients are in currently. In order to do this, we're going to use one of two different classification standards that are out there, and they're really used pretty much throughout the country. The first of these is going to be the AHA ACC stages of heart failure. And the purpose of this classification scale is to really define objectively by the amount of structural heart disease that a patient has. And for this scale, there are four stages. We call them A, B, C, and D. And so to start, a person who's a stage A is essentially high risk for heart failure due to other conditions such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes. But the important thing to know here is that at this point, they're asymptomatic. So for stage B, what we see here is patients who actually have structural disease, but they still are without any symptoms of heart failure. Now moving on to stage C, this is again where we have patients with structural heart disease, but at this point they either have or have had previously symptoms of heart failure. And so at this point, the, the process is really starting to, to become more advanced because the patient is exhibiting symptoms as a result of their heart failure. Now for stage D, this is where we move on and we have patients who really have an advanced level of structural disease going on. In addition to that, they're going to have marked symptoms while at rest despite treatment that they've been undergoing. And so essentially you can see based on what a patient's classification stage using this system is, you can really tell how much structural disease they have going on as well as whether or not they're exhibiting symptoms as a result of that disease. Now the other classification system that we use is something that we call the New York Heart Association Functional Classification. And for this classification system, we're going to use a stress test, and this is where a patient is going to be evaluated at rest and with activity. And for this system, there's also four classifications that we will use, but for these, they're going to be one, two, three, and four. So similarly to the other classification system, a class one heart failure is going to be somebody who has underlying disease and risk factors without any limitations on activity. So essentially they're able to perform ordinary physical activity without any symptoms. And these symptoms that we'd be looking at are like fatigue, palpitations, difficulty breathing, or anginal pain. Now for our class two, these are gonna be our patients who actually have heart failure going on. And so what we're gonna see with these patients are that they have some sort of slight limitation with physical activity, but when they're at rest, that they remain comfortable. So for these patients, ordinary physical activity is gonna cause some symptoms. And again, these are gonna be those same symptoms that we just talked about. Now for our class three heart failure, this is where we're gonna see patients who have a marked limitation on their physical activity. Essentially, minor physical activity is gonna cause these patients symptoms. But when they are at rest, they are still comfortable. Now finally onto our fourth and final classification. These are where we're going to have patients that truly have an inability to carry out any sort of physical act activity without discomfort. And on top of that, the symptoms that they are having may also be present at rest. So as you can see with this functional classification, you can really tell what sort of functional ability your patient has based on 
how severe their heart failure is. So like I said, these are two very common classification systems that you guys will see throughout the country, and they're really important to know these because they will give you a picture of how far or how advanced your patient's heart failure is. All right, so the last and final thing that I want to talk about now is how we actually treat our patients with heart failure. And so to really preface this, my point in talking about this treatment is not to cover every possible option of treatment that's available out there, but I really want to give you guys a good overview of what the common forms of treatment are, why we would be doing them, and what this ultimately will mean for our patients in terms of their heart failure. So in order to look at the treatment options that are available to our patients, we really need to divide this up into two categories. The first of these is going to be our early stages. And the other, which I'm sure you can probably figure out, is going to be our late stages. So as we talk about the early stages, this is where we're going to have patients that might not have any symptoms. So they definitely have risk factors and underlying diseases that could lead them to heart failure, or if they do already have heart failure, that could lead to worsening of their heart failure. But really our first step is looking to improve the risk factors. And the reason for this is oftentimes these structural changes that you see that take place, like the ones that we talked about in the second lesson in this series, typically once they happen, they tend to not be reversible. So we wanna catch these patients early who have these risk factors and put interventions and things in place in order to prevent them from getting to that point to where they start to develop those structural changes. Because unfortunately, once that begins, then we're going to start that cycle of progression that we talked about. So the first and most obvious thing that we're going to suggest for our patients is that they get exercise. We all know the benefits of exercise, but really it's going to increase the strength of their heart and give them that efficient pumping ability. We're going to work to build up that muscle instead of going down the road of a failing heart muscle. And as we all know, along with exercise also comes the importance of diet. And so on top of all the typical healthy eating stuff that we want to be encouraging them to do, two of the big things that we're really focusing on are a reduction in their salt intake and a reduction in the fats. So as we all know, by reducing our salt intake, we're going to help to decrease our patient's blood pressure. Again, one of those risk factors towards going down that progression into heart failure. And then by also reducing the fats, we're going to be reducing our risk for buildup of plaque in that coronary artery disease. Now, the third and final thing that we may look to do is to actually start these patients on some sort of medications. But again, the purpose of these medications are to treat those risk factors and underlying diseases to prevent them from going into heart failure. And oftentimes these medications are gonna be geared towards reducing their blood pressure. And so again, as I said, these aren't gonna be all of the medications that are available, but some of the ones that we may be looking at are things like our ACE inhibitors, hydrolazine and nitrates, and our beta blockers. So with the ACE inhibitors, that these are vasodilators, and they work by inhibiting the angiotensin-converting enzyme. If you want to watch another video that's a good lesson on this pathway of what's happening with these enzymes, uh, I'll link to my lesson on shock pathophysiology in which I discuss this. But by inhibiting the angiotensin-converting enzyme, it's going to act as a vasodilator, and so this is going to widen those blood vessels, which means lower blood pressure for our patient. Ultimately, this makes it easier for the heart to pump against. And as we had talked about in the past, it's that workload of having to consistently contract against that high pressure of hypertension that can lead our patients into heart failure. Now, hydrolazine is a vasodilator specifically for the arteries. So this is going to work to decrease, again, that resistance that the heart's having to pump against. But the nitrates here, while it acts both on arteries and veins, it's primarily a dilator for veins. And so this is also going to work to reduce the preload and, again, help to reduce some of those structural changes that we see in the heart. And finally, our beta blockers. So these we're going to be using to inhibit the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. 
Again, I talk about that in the video on shock pathophysiology, but these are blocking our beta receptor sites. And so we know that these beta receptor sites are used to increase heart rate, increase that contractility, as well as they also can cause vasoconstriction within our blood vessels. And so by blocking this, we're going to allow our patients to have a slower heart rate and decreasing that contractility, that strength of contraction, along with lowering the resistance that the heart is going to have to beat against, all of these working to reduce those structural changes. So again, between our exercise, diet, and some of these preventative medications, we really want to look to prevent our patient from getting to that point to where they're in heart failure, or if they already have started down that path, but they're very early on, we want to do everything we can to stop that progression of structural changes. So now as we move on and talk about patients in the late stages, at this point, the patient is exhibiting symptoms. And so our treatment in this stage is going to be designed towards the reduction of these symptoms that our patients are experiencing. And in order to do this, there's three primary ways in which we're going to be treating this patient's heart failure. The first is going to be to limit the initial insult and treat the underlying cause. The next is going to be to manage fluid volume overload. And the final thing, which is actually the most involved that we're going to talk about in a minute, is to improve our ventricular function. So to go back to the top, in order to, to limit this initial insult and treat that cause, we have to, if it's possible, put some sort of interventions in place that work to stop whatever's going on, if we can, on what's causing these issues with our patient. And so this is going to be things like giving our patient a fibrinolytic, going to the cath lab for acute MI. Now, in addition to that, we're also going to be looking to revascularize our patients who have that persistent ischemia with the goal of we want to reduce that tissue necrosis. And so once again, this can be something that we do in cath lab, or the patients can go to the OR and have a cabbage done. And finally, if this is going to be the result of some sort of valve issue, then once again, they can go to the the OR, or even these days we're doing some of these procedures within cath lab to do a valve repair or replacement. And so ultimately we have to fix this underlying problem, otherwise anything else that we do in order to treat these patients is really going to be ineffective because we haven't taken care of that initial problem. So now as we move on and we look at the management of our patient's fluid volume overload, this is going to be primarily done through our diuretics, as well as continued fluid and sodium restriction. So we want to have our patients on set fluid restriction, set sodium restriction, diets that are low in sodium, but we may also need to use things like diuretics. And typically these are going to be our loop diuretics, but often we will switch those or add on others such as the thiazides or, or other type of diuretics. But for patients that are having really severe symptoms, this may actually require getting some sort of IV administration of a loop diuretic to really work to get that fluid off quickly for those patients. All right, and so finally as we move on and we talk about improving ventricular function, there's a lot of different ways in which we're going to be looking to do this. The first of these, which we pretty much just talked about already, is we're going to want to reduce our patient's preload. And the point of reducing this preload is we want to reduce that amount of stretch that's going on inside those ventricles, which are going to contribute to those structural changes. But in addition to reducing their preload, we also need to look at reducing their afterload. And once again, we had already kind of talked about some of these in the early stages treatment, but typically our first line treatment with this is going to be our ACE inhibitors. Now there are some symptoms that are associated with this that patients just don't tolerate. So if that's the case, you can switch them to an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker, but primarily the ACE inhibitors are our first line of choice. In addition to that, you can also add other vasodilators that can be combined with the ACE inhibitors and the diuretics. So again, our purpose here is we wanna reduce that afterload. We wanna make it easier for the heart to contract so that there's less workload that is happening again, leading to those structural changes. 
Now, along with these, we also want to be giving the patient medications that are going to be reducing the remodeling that's going on inside the heart. So we want to try to reduce that structural change that's happening, and certainly medications that we can give them can be beneficial for that. For this, really our ACE inhibitors and our beta blockers are the cornerstone of this therapy. But we can also use aldosterone blocking agents. These are going to be things like the isosorbide, hydralazine may also be used for this. And finally, you could also use medication called digoxin. So this definitely has been shown to be effective. It used to be one of the primary forms of treatment, but nowadays that's really not the case unless our patient happens to have AFib or a flutter that's present. Now another thing that we may be looking to do for our patients is to decrease that sympathetic response. And once again, our beta blockers are great candidates for this. And again, by reducing this sympathetic response, we're going to be reducing that heart rate, that contractility, the blood pressure along with it, all of these things reducing the workload of the heart. Now, another type of treatment that we can look for with these patients is something that we call cardiac resynchronization therapy. And essentially, this is using a pacemaker and or an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So these we're going to be looking at using dual chamber pacemakers to appropriately pace our patients, especially in the case where they might have a bundle branch on one side, causing a dyssynchrony between the left and right side of the hearts beating together. And so this dual chamber pacemaker would stimulate both ventricles together to give that synchronized contraction. In addition to that, we'd have the ICD because these patients are going to be at high risk of these arrhythmias, and these can be used to cardiovert them out of certain arrhythmias or even defibrillate them in the event that they experience some sort of significant cardiac event. And the other benefit, too, of the pacemaker is if they have these Y QRS complexes as a result of either these bundle branch blocks or just this low voltage conductivity, by using the pacemaker, we can actually give them a narrower QRS, which is going to improve that cardiac contraction that they have. All right, so so far at this point, we've done quite a bit to try to manage some of these late stages of heart failure for our patients. But some patients, depending on how far advanced they are in their heart failure, this type of treatment just isn't going to be enough for them. So some patients, despite our best efforts, will continue to progress in their heart failure and may require one of two final treatment options. The first of these is going to be some sort of cardiac assist device. And really these cardiac assist devices, sometimes they can be a temporary intervention and we use them to really preserve our ventricular function. And we use these as a bridge to recovery. So we want to rest the ventricle or ventricles in hopes of by reducing that workload, we give that heart time to recover. And typically these are going to be in our acute heart failures or patients who have heart failure but have these acute exacerbations. And these cardiac assist devices can be available for either the left side independently or the right side independently or even by ventricular support. Now, in addition to the temporary measures, there are also implantable, more permanent devices that our patients can get as well. And ultimately, these devices can really be used with two main goals in mind. The first is to bridge them to some sort of heart transplant, or the other is what we call destination therapy, which is really to provide them more time and more comfort, but without any transplant endgame. And so to kind of talk about some of these devices, like I said, they can oftentimes for some of these temporary devices, they can be inserted percutaneously uh, or even surgically, but definitely for these long-term devices, we're typically looking at a surgical implant. The first of these, though, that I want to talk about is probably one of the oldest ones that's out there, and this is the intra-aortic balloon pump. Essentially what this is is a catheter that's inserted in the aorta with a large balloon and it detects when the heart contracts and what happens is the balloon will deflate just before the heart contracts. 
And the point of this is to create a vacuum in an area of lower pressure and thus reduce the afterload that the heart is having to beat against. Now after the heart is contract, that balloon reinflates. This actually causes the blood to travel retrograde up the aorta and can also be used to help increase the coronary artery perfusion. Now the next set of devices are what we call our ventricular assist devices. And so like I said, these can be temporary devices, things such as an impella, uh, or they can also be more permanent surgically implanted devices. Now these come in several different fashions, but the essential goal is to take the blood from one of the ventricles and to move it out into either the pulmonary artery or the aorta. And so by doing this, we're going to be reducing, one, our patient's afterload, but really primarily we're going to be reducing that ventricular workload. So by running these pumps and moving the blood for the ventricle, we drastically reduce the workload that that ventricle has to do in order to move that blood. So in the acute setting, we reduce that workload to rest the heart, but in these end-stage heart failure patients, they just do not have the ability to pump this blood by themselves, and so these devices are used to do the workload for them. Now, you may also see a surgical intervention called ventricular reconstruction, which is essentially where they'll go in and surgically try to reduce the size of the ventricles in the case of these patients with these hypertrophic ventricles. Although really our most recent studies are showing that there's really no change in mortality for these patients, and so this isn't something you're going to see very often. Now in addition to these, another thing that you may also see is something that we call ECMO, or more specifically our VA ECMO. Now I won't go too in-depth into what ECMO is and how it works. In fact, that may be a future lesson at some point. But what you really need to know is that this is going to be for our severely decompensated heart failure patients who are in cardiogenic shock. By putting a patient on VA ECMO, we can just about completely take over the workload of their heart and do all of the pumping for them. That's essentially where this particular name of VA comes from, veno-arterial. So we're going to pull from the veins before the heart and then return into an artery after the heart. Now, at this point, we would be bypassing the lungs for the most part, and so we also are going to be able to oxygenate that blood through our ECMO circuit. But the, the primary goal in this discussion and talking about these heart failure patients is the heart is just in full-on cardiogenic shock. It is in no way able to provide any sort of cardiac output for our patient, and so by placing them on VA ECMO, we can completely take over that functioning. Now, by having a patient on VA ECMO, we can use this as a bridge either towards their recovery and decannulation off ECMO. We can use it to bridge them to some sort of implantable ventricular assist device, uh, as well as you can also use it as a bridge to heart transplant. And so these are essentially the, the primary devices that you're going to see as interventions put in place for these patients who are really at these end stages of heart failure. And so then finally, really the last treatment option that we are able to offer some of our patients, which we've already talked about a few times here already, is going to be our heart transplant. And so really our goal at this point is to remove our patient's heart and provide them with a new one that's going to be able to work and function at a level in which they need. Now, in talking about heart transplant, there is something that, that we can do for patients that technically would fall in the category of cardiac assist device. And what this is, is where we would surgically remove the patient's heart, someone who would be a transplant candidate potentially, and then we can implant something like a total artificial heart in them. And this device is able to completely take over, obviously, the work of the patient's heart that's no longer there and is able to move that blood around the patient's body with the end goal of getting to a heart transplant. So really it's some pretty amazing stuff that we have at our disposal these days. And definitely as we advance further in these stages of heart failure, we can really see some very sick patients. But with a lot of different treatment modalities and interventions and even devices that we can use to try and help them out and get them through this or to alleviate these symptoms with the end goal knowing that we're not going to be able to reverse their heart failure. 
All right, so we definitely covered quite a bit in this lesson. We talked initially about those different tests that we use to help to try and diagnose our patients with heart failure. And then we went on to talk about the two different classification scales that we use to try and quantify the level of heart failure that our patients are exhibiting. And then finally, we moved on to talk about the treatment options, the modalities, both in early stages and late stages of heart failure. And again, this isn't covering all of the treatment options that are available, but to give you a really good overview and an understanding of what these things are that we're looking to try to do. And so with all of that said, that's going to conclude this lesson, uh, as well as it's going to conclude this series of lessons that we have for you guys on heart failure. And I do want to truly thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you guys stuck with everything throughout these four lessons and that you guys have a much better understanding of heart failure, what it is, what it looks like for your patient, how we diagnose it, and ultimately how we're going to treat that for them. I really hope that you guys found this lesson as well as all the other lessons to be of benefit for you guys, that you guys were able to get some good information out of it. And if you did, please go down and hit the like button and leave us a comment and let us know what you think, as well as feel free to ask any questions that you have. We really love answering the questions that you guys put out there. If you haven't already as well, subscribe to our channel below. That way you'll continue to receive notifications of these future lessons that we do. And to go along with this series, I'm going to link to the series of lessons that we have on our hemodynamics because a lot of that plays into the way that we evaluate and treat our patients that do have heart failure. As well as I'm going to link to the last lesson that I did before starting this heart failure series, which I did a great lesson covering the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is something I think you guys might enjoy as well. So with that said, as always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching and you guys have a wonderful day.